introduced him. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers for allowing me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little bit about this paper and some work in preparation with Daniel. Um, some of the topics I'm going to discuss will be covered in more detail in Daniel's talk on Thursday and probably much more coherently. So anything that doesn't make sense in my talk, I'm sure will get cleared up then. OK, so what is it that I'm trying to do? Well, I'm interested in four-dimensional gauge theories with semi-simple gauge groups. And the reason that I'm interested in these theories is that we appear to live in a world of four dimensions, and I'm happy to take that as a data point. It seems a reasonable class of theories to consider. Um, and also, we know that the standard model works very well for a wide range of uh, phenomena, and it is a gauge theory which has a semi-simple gauge group. And so again, it seems reasonable that we might be interested in the behavior of these sorts of theories. We know very well that such theories can be asymptotically free, and I'm interested to know if there are any other UV possibilities for these sorts of theories. And throughout this, I'm going to be using perturbation theory, and I'm going to be doing that because it will make life easier in a couple of ways, and we'll be able to make some hard statements about such theories. So very quickly, uh, going to be considering the renormalization group equations. So we've got some running couplings, and they will, their running is described by beta functions, and that will be entirely determined by the field content and symmetries of our theory. And there's lots of ways that you can calculate these beta functions, and as I've mentioned, I'm going to be calculating them within perturbation theory. And in particular, I'm going to be interested in fixed points. So this is points where the beta functions vanish. Um, so depending on what happens to trajectories when they come in the vicinity of these fixed points, we can classify them in terms of UV or IR theories. Uh, and I'm interested in ultraviolet fixed points. Um, and this will allow us to define QFTs up to highest energies. So that's the main thing. And in perturbation theory, the way that feed functions are calculated is just through um, an expansion in terms of the couplings. So we just expand in the series, and then these coefficients are determined by the particular theory of interest. And one of the reasons why I'm going to be using perturbation theory is that a lot of the heavy lifting has already been done. And so in, for general renormalizable four-dimensional field theories, these things have been calculated perturbatively. Um, and so we can make some strong statements based on the structure of these things. Um, and also, it's practically easier because it means uh, calculations are a bit easier to do. And also, it's a useful starting point because, because we're going to be using exactly perturbative theories. We can make very hard statements, and this will be a good point to then, um, if you want to look at things non-perturbatively, um, it's a useful place to start from. So if we're restricting ourselves to perturbation theory, I mean, in general, for a fixed point, there's either two options. Either all your couplings are zero, or all your couplings aren't zero. Or some of your couplings are non-zero, at least. Um, now, for imperturbation theory, this is only going to be valid if we have small couplings. Um, and so what this means is that the couplings must be much, much less than one. So they can either be zero, or they can be small. So I'm going to be mostly in the cases where they're non-zero, because we um, understand asymptotic freedom fairly well. And one of the other aspects of perturbation theory will mean that there will only be small corrections to the anomalous dimensions. So this means that the classical mass dimension of operators is still going to be what governs their relevance. And this means that we already know beforehand which operators are relevant, which operators are irrelevant, and we only need to consider the marginal operators. So we don't have to worry about um, truncations and such. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we need for this to occur. It's going to start with just a one-loop uh, beta function for the gauge coupling. It, just in term, it only depends upon itself. And the single coefficient b here determines exactly what happens to the gauge coupling in the UV. So the only fixed point we have is the Gaussian fixed point. And depending on the sign of the b, if it's positive, then it's a UV fixed point, and we have asymptotic freedom. If it's negative, then it's IR. 
and the theory can't be UV completed at this order of approximation. So this either means that we have a big problem or we need to worry about higher order corrections. And what determines B is purely in terms of the gauge group and the matter content. So we see that in general for a non-abelian theory, B can have either sign. We get contributions acting negatively from the gauge bosons and we have the other sign contributions from matter. And so if we have no matter or a small amount of matter, then we'll have an asymptotically free theory. And if we have more matter, then we lose asymptotic freedom. So what happens if we go to higher order? So if we have no other couplings in our theory, then we get an additional term here, the C term, which again will depend upon the matter content of the theory. And we find that as well as the Gaussian fixed point, we potentially have another fixed point given by this combination here. So if we want this to be physical, we need alpha to be greater than zero, so we need both of these guys to have the same sign. And if we want it to be perturbative, which it must be for our um, approximation to work, then we need B to be much, much smaller than C. And so this is what the, the two-loop coefficient looks like. Again, it's given purely in terms of the um, gauge group factors. Um, and what we find is that, again, the, the signs contribute oppositely from the gauge bosons and from the matter content. And so, again, if we have not very much matter, then C will be negative when B is positive. And if we have lots of matter, then the signs will flip. In both of these cases, we don't have an interacting fixed point. We also know that both, uh, both of these signs can be positive. This is the famous banks X infrared fixed point, and there's lots of theories of which this is just one example. Now, it turns out that it is not possible to have the other case where both B and C are less than zero. So it's not possible to have a UV fixed point in this theory. Uh, and I'm sure Daniel will talk more about this on Thursday. So now, Yukawa couplings. These are the next thing to consider because they also contribute at two loop to the running of the gauge coupling. Um, and they arise very naturally when we have theories which have fermions and scalars in them. And so the term contributing comes like this in terms of the, the Casimir matrix and also these Yukawa coupling matrices. And the important thing to notice here is that this contribution is always negative regardless of the details of our theory. And so in, in theory, this may be able to help us out because it may dampen the running of the gauge coupling sufficiently to allow us to develop an interacting fixed point. So to understand that, we need to look at the running of the Yukawa coupling itself. This is given in a, in a general form like this, where the E is a cubic in the Yukawa matrices and F is um, linear. And just from a dimensional analysis, you see that the solution to um, this fixed point equation will have to be of this form, um, where C is just some numerical matrix which depends upon the Yukawa structure of the theory. And so if we project the gauge beta function onto this solution, we find that the net effect is that the coefficient, the two-loop coefficient C gets um, shifted to an effective two-loop coefficient C prime, um, where this solution then determines exactly by how much it's shifted. And now this plays the same role as C in the above case. So uh, we need B and C prime to have the same sign here to develop an interacting fixed point. And we see that because this Yukawa contribution is always going to be negative, the C prime is always going to be smaller than C. So it may, in fact, be possible to have C prime negative, in which case we will get an ultraviolet fixed point. If it doesn't have this sign, then we will get an IR fixed point in the case where we have asymptotic freedom. So that was all in general. But here um, we can look at a specific example. Um, and this is the example that Francesco was talking about this morning. So, Again, all, all, all so far has just been using a simple gauge group. So we just have a, an SUK gauge group. We have a matrix of uncharged scalars. Um, and we take the Venetiana limit where we let NF and K go to infinity while keeping their ratio fixed. And this allows us to have some small parameter which we have complete control over. And that allows us to make sure that our couplings are exactly perturbative. Uh, and we find that if we have a Yukawa term of this form which mixes it through a matrix, then indeed, this uh, effective two-loop term is negative, which means that we end up with a, an ultraviolet fixed point. And this will be a useful theory to consider when we are trying to build uh, semi-simple theories, as we, we have this example and we know it works. It's a hard, um, specific theory. 
And for such theories, uh, the phase diagram looks like something like this. So this is the, the gauge coupling here, uh, and this is the, the Yukawa coupling. And we see that there's a yeah, fully interacting fixed point here, and there's exactly two UV trajectories, one which leads down to the Gaussian fixed point in the infrared, uh, and another one which flows off the strong coupling. Uh, and we see that in the vicinity of the Gaussian fixed point, we have lost asymptotic freedom, and it's an entirely infrared fixed point. So what happens if we have a semi-simple gauge group? So all that happens is that the, the two-loop beta function is almost the same. The main difference being is that we now have two-loop terms which mix the different gauge couplings together. So I've written it here just with a, a single Yukawa, but really this um, form generalizes if we have multiple Yukawa couplings. Um, so even before worrying about the Yukawa couplings, we might think that maybe these off-diagonal terms can help us. Maybe if these guys are negative, we don't have to have Yukawa couplings. Maybe we can find um, a, a UV fixed point with uh, these guys if they're contributing negatively. But sadly, they're not. All these um, off-diagonal terms are also positive. Um, and so you can see that this uh, has the form of a matrix equation. Uh, and the right-hand side it always has to be positive because all of these coefficients are positive. And that means the left-hand side has to be positive also to have solutions to this equation. And if the left-hand side is positive, that means we're sitting where we have asymptotic freedom. So this doesn't really help us. So again, we um, add Yukawa interactions. And it's very much the same story as before, except now the Yukawa beta function will depend, in general, on all of the gauge root factors. Um, and so, in general, that means that all of these guys, these two-loop terms, are going to be shifted by some amount. Some of them may be shifted by zero, but in general, they can all be shifted, and they'll all be shifted by some negative amount. So we'll end up with some reduced matrix, which is smaller numerically than the one we originally had. Um, and so now there's no constraint on the this um, sorry should yeah so there's no constraint on these uh, coefficients c so this doesn't have to be bigger than zero this should very much not be there um, so we can have the right hand side being negative uh, and which means that the left hand side can also be negative so it may be possible to have um, solutions where some of these factors are, are negative, which means that we've lost asymptotic freedom, um, and such a fixed point will have ultraviolet directions. And this can be achieved either through um, the diagonal terms, or we can do it through changing the off-diagonal terms, which is a mechanism that's not available in the simple gauge group case. So as well as this fully interacting fixed point, there'll be um, some partially interacting fixed points as well. Now that we have more than one gauge coupling, um, we know that for each gauge coupling, the, the free fixed point is always going to be there. It's always going to renormalize in proportion to itself. Um, and so we, we have the possibility of setting one of the gauge group um, couplings to zero and finding an interacting fixed point in the other set. Um, and so in general, there's going to be two to the number of groups that we have. So for each gauge factor, we can either have it on or sitting on its free fixed point. And when we have these sorts of fixed points, what we'll find is that generally there'll be marginal directions. So when we try to linearize around the fixed point to um, understand the critical exponents, there'll be some zeros there. Um, and to understand what happens in these directions, then we'll need to look at the effective one-loop term. So instead of expanding the beta function around the Gaussian fixed point, we um, effectively expand it around the... Um, the fixed point, this partially interacting fixed point, and we'll find that there's a, an effective one-loop term which will receive um, contributions from the two-loop uh, gauge fixed point and also from the Yukawa couplings. And there's no need for the sign of this B to be correlated with the sign of this B. So just as a sort of little example to show with uh, some slightly more concrete numbers, if you have uh, two groups, um, a single Yukawa coupling, then we'll have four fixed points, one of which is this partially interacting fixed point, 
where alpha 1 is 0, but alpha 2 sits on some interacting uh, point. Uh, and then to determine whether or not alpha 1 will have a, a UV direction, uh, we need to evaluate this one loop effective coefficient, which will be helped by the Yukawa coupling, and it will be hindered slightly by this alpha 2 fixed point. And depending on the exact theory, we'll find out whether or not this guy wins and whether or not then this becomes asymptotically free. So what do we want if we're looking for a, a, a semi-simple example theory? We want to, um, following the example of the simple case, we want to have a controllable small parameter. So we're going to take a generalized Veneziano limit. We're going to take lots of all of our flavor group to be um, infinite and our gauge groups to be infinitely large while keeping the ratios of the various quantities fixed. Um, yeah, we'll need fields to have two of these large indices to make sure that they contribute um, appropriately. Uh, and we're going to need something that speaks to both gauge groups so that they interact with each other and um, some free parameters so that we can uh, play around a little bit. So the first example um, is going to be based on the, the simple gauge group example we had. So we just take two copies of it. We have the, the same content, just doubles, one in one gauge group and one in the other gauge group. And we're going to minimally couple them by adding just a single fermion that's in the fundamental representation of each uh, of the gauge groups so that we have some of these cross terms appearing. Uh, and if we do this, it's fairly simple to calculate these uh, pizza functions. It's not very different from the uh, sim simple gauge group case. Uh, and then we find that we get an exact UV fixed point which is interacting in one gauge group and is free in the other one. So it's something like asymptotic freedom cross asymptotic safety. Um, and we do also have a fully interacting fixed point, which in general is less relevant and it will be um, uh, more of a crossover type, so um, partially infrared. So then you may wonder, is it possible to find a model where we have asymptotic safety, where we've completely lost lost asymptotic freedom in the gauge theory. So in that case, we still had asymptotic freedom in one um, direction. And the answer is yes. So again, we take the simple gauge group uh, model that works. We add um, a second SUM with uh, additional fermions, again, in its fundamental. We add some charged scalars now, uh, which are charged under the second gauge group. Uh, and then we add another Yukawa coupling, which couples these new charge scalars to some of our original fermions and to this field, which talks to both gauge groups. So this will allow us to um, change these off-diagonal terms. Uh, and again, we can compute the beta functions fairly straightforwardly, and we find that we can end up with three different exact fixed points. Um, two of which are only interacting in the first gauge group uh, and change slightly in their Yukawa um, contributions, and another one which is fully interacting in all four couplings. And we have a bunch of parameters that we can play around with in theory, um, and depending on how we play around with them, we see that at different regions, different numbers of these fixed points are physical and non-physical. So in these two cases, A and C, in fact, um, only work if we set the second gauge group coupling to be exactly zero for all RG scales. So in some sense, these are just kind of generalized simple theories. But for B, D, and E, we do have um, RG dynamics in both gauge groups. And so we can kind of schematically look at what happens uh, in the phase diagram for each. Um, so in this, we've got the, the fi first fixed point, which flows to the second, and they both flow to the Gaussian. Um, and we have similar things going on in these two cases. Um, and here and here, we have what looks more like the classic asymptotic freedom, where we just have um, asymptotic safety, sorry, where we have um, a single interacting uh, fixed point flowing to the Gaussian. And we can in certain cases, take slices through coupling space to project the, um, the flow. So this is in the case where we have uh, a fully interacting fixed point and a partially interacting fixed point. So I've projected it onto the uh, Yukawa null line. Uh, and so here what we see is in the vicinity of the Gaussian, indeed, we've lost um, asymptotic freedom in both gauge directions. So it's fully infrared. Um, and we have a partially interacting 
uh, gauge you car fixed point which flows to the Gaussian um, and it also flows up to this fully interacting fixed point. And so we have a two-dimensional UV critical surface here. Uh, and this is in contrast to uh, region E where we have only the fully interacting fixed point um, and the Gaussian and this uh, is of the same form as in the simple gauge group case where we just have one trajectory running to the Gaussian fixed point and another one um, flowing off up to the strong coupling. So to conclude, uh, it is possible to have um, asymptotic safety um, in a theories uh, with semi-simple gauge groups uh, and exact perturbative uh, fixed points. Uh, general, we'll also have um, a range of partially interacting fixed points, which uh, in general will be more UV relevant. Um, and all of this can very easily be uh, generalized to multiple gauge group factors. Um, okay, uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>